Um, so my name is Alan McGuire, I work in the Linux kernel networking team in Oracle and I'm going to be talking about BPF tracing and how we can make some improvements there. Um, let me just share my webcam as well. The kind of idea behind this talk is that um, GDB um, for debugging has a deep history of uh, making debugging software easier. Um, but as the world gets more parallel, which is clearly what's happening, um, a lot of problems aren't as amenable to that kind of linear form of debugging that GDB supports. Um, so I'm thinking of cases like you know, race conditions and time sensitive issues where BPF tracing is really the right solution because it's such low overhead and you know we can collect information from multiple threads. Um, but of course then BPF tracing isn't quite as feature rich as, as something like GDB at this point. So I'm going to talk about some of the features we could look at adding, uh, mainly through additions to the BPF type format. Um, but of course in doing so it's important to bear in mind what the trade-offs are um, in that context. So um, principally with the, the BPF type format, the, the compact nature of it is, is the key thing because you want to carry that around with your running kernel. Um, so keeping things small is very important. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that a little bit as, as we move on, move through. So I've kind of ordered things in terms of the sort of complexity of the task and what the cost is. So I'm going to be talking about how to display um, data structures in depth. Um, how to maybe look at including macros in, in the BPF type format, um, maybe look at inline functions as well as a potential thing we could represent in the BPF type format. I mean, the Linux curl is heavily inline, so if you've ever used a tracer, you've probably had that moment of frustration when you tried to trace a function and you realized it wasn't there because it had been inlined. Um, so, you know, are there ways we could help with that, um, that experience? And then finally, um, you know, to get to the sort of extreme case, um, local variable representation. I mean, you know, it probably seems ridiculous to do something there, but um, it's worth looking at what the constraints are in that space too. So if you use UDB, you've probably used this print um, so command, which is very useful for examining data. So we can see um, using dwarf, it can look at the type associated with the variable and print out the various content of that variable um, in, in depth, which is nice. Um, so libbpf um, has already provided ways of dumping um, data structures. Um, you've used this probably if you've done BPF tracing to generate a header, um, a kernel header. So one of the kind of pain points when you were doing BPF development traditionally was having to include a bunch of kernel header files and sometimes the, you know, they wouldn't like each other and you get compilation failures. So one of the nice things that's, that, that was added was the capability to actually dump all of the kernel data structures um, to, to a header file using BPF tools. So um, basically the BPF type format that you carry around with your kernel um, is just unfolded recursively so you get all the various types that you might need in your program. Um, and as part of that, with, with a huge amount of help from Andre, and, and thank you for that, um, we, I, we recently added a way of dumping not just the type information, but typed data representations. So the idea there is that if you've got a piece of data that you want to look at, um, and you know what type that data is, um, you can use the interf those interfaces for, to, to solve that problem. Um, so you use the BTF ID associated with the type, and then you get a, a dump of that data. So to just give a, give an example, here's a, an SK buff, and we can see it's kind of similar to that output from GDB I showed earlier. So um, you know you can see not only the the various um, elements of the data structure, you can also see the values associated with that as well. Um, so this is actually in libbpf now. I think it was in 5.14 it, it landed. So that capability is there now. So. Um, you can use that. And, you know, for for the future, it would be nice to, if we could integrate some of that with some of the existing tracing um, technology that we have. So things like BPF Trace and Perf and um, a BPF based G-Trace, which is under development as well. Um, to kind of help with that process, I tried to create um, a, a tool called CaseNoop, which is basically just a kind of um, a way of exhibiting this capability. So the kind of idea of CaseNoop is um, just to be able to trace arguments and return values of kernel functions. Um, so it gives you the full argument data and return value data associated with function entry and return. Um, and that's been merged into, um, if you've ever used BCC, it's in the libbpf tools there. So the libbpf tools and BCC aren't, you know, they aren't using Python, they aren't using, using any of that, they're using the BPF directly and BPF skeletons to actually just give you one binary, which which will um, will solve whatever problem you have. So it's just kind of a proof of concept idea um, that allows you to unfold all that data. So 
sort of you know things we could do with that um one of the things that the case snoop tool supports is capturing um data from a specific set of functions so that which when they're called in a specific order so for example if you if you had syscaller um a syscaller failure with a particular stack signature um it's so it would be useful to be able to see what the arguments were to those functions as they kind of as, as your system kind of went on its way to failing um so one idea would be that you know as part of syscaller's operation uh, it encounters a failure tries to create a reproducer and then you know you get the information about the failure and the reproducer so if because we have the stack signature for that failure we could use that um, deep data structure um analysis to actually add probes for the various functions um and then we could capture that data um so not you not only would you get a stack trace effectively um when you actually got that failure information you could actually get the arguments to the functions as as they occurred and as i said um case has some functionality that does this as well so the idea is that if we use the dash s option there um it allows us to capture you know function one eventually calls function two which calls function three and then finally calls function four and if we see that sequence in, in any thread um, we'll get the basically we're storing the information as as we go through that stack of functions, and if we hit the end function, having hit all the other functions along the way, um, we get what we get output from that. But only in that case. So it's a way of basically saying, if you see this stack signature, um, g give me the arguments and return values associated with that. If if anything did return. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, just integrating that kind of deep data inspection to some of some of our kind of bots and tools would, would be interesting, I think would be useful. Um, another thing we could potentially look at is a diff style output. Um, so, you know, one of the things you might want to do, particularly if you're doing something like watch point based analysis, where you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with data corruption and you don't know who's doing what, um, or you want to figure out how your data structure is changing, perhaps as you step through a function, which you could do with tracing as well. Um, you could, you know, one option we could look at is expanding the options available to, to that data dumping to support passing a template, um, template data with a, with an associated size as well into the function. And where fields differed um, from the template, they, they'd be outputted in a diff style output. So it's just trying to bring some of the capabilities that, you know, we have in analyzing code um, to, to the data that we use as well. So I think there's a lot of options here we could explore. So this is just to try and suggest a couple of a couple of ideas in that direction. Um, this might be a good point to pause before we go on to the next um, section, just in case there's any questions or comments. Um, let me just see there. Um, the chat, I'm not seeing anything on the chat at the moment, so um, if there are any questions, maybe um, somebody could let me know. The chat seems to be um, hung for some reason. Alan? Uh, real quick, I think your um, sound is or your gain is kind of high. Oh, sure. Yeah, because I've been going from conference to conference and yours really, really loud compared to everyone else. How's that? Is that a bit better? A little bit better, maybe a little bit lower. Sure. Right, uh, yeah, that sounds okay. better. Great. Yeah, much better. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so, if there's no other questions, you might keep moving. Um, so, as I said, when we run BF programs, we could generate a header um, from the BPF type format information to capture all those types from the kernel. Um, and split BTF actually allows us to do this for, for modules too, so we can capture module data structures as well, which is really nice. Um, so that header generation process and the compile once run everywhere capability, which allows us to build our binary once and it'll run on different kernel versions using B BTF to figure out what the offsets of data structures are. Um, and along with the BPF, BPF tool skeleton functionality, which is really nice because that actually allows us to embed our BPF program in the user space binary, um, which is which I find to be very handy. So the idea is rather than having a user space program and a BPF program you've got to carry around, you actually get to embed your, your bytecode in, in your pro user space program as well. So all those things have really added up to make a BPF program development much easier. Um, there's a lot less wrestling with kernel headers, but there is still one time you need to do that, and that's when we're dealing with hash defines and macros. Um, so um, there is a way to do this. And, and again, you know, harking back to GDB, GDB had to wrestle with this problem as well. So um, to help with that, GCC actually supports uh, an option, uh, dash G GDB3, to add debug macro sections to Dwarf. Um, so for example, you know, if we've got some definitions there, um, they get added to that debug macro section via these um, uh, macro to, to find indirect um, tags. So um, 
you know, the GDB uses this then, so you can actually reference some of the macros in, in, in your debugging, so it could be useful there. But, you know, for our purposes, it would be useful to have, you know, things like, um, you know, constant value definitions, so we don't have to redefine them, and, you know, or we don't have to include the kernel headers that define them. Um, so that, that makes life a lot easier. Um, but then, of course, the big question, you know, the loons over all of these things is what's the cost? So in when we look at VM Linux built with that option, um, there is 1.6 million definitions, which is a lot, obviously. Um, but most of these are duplicated because, you know, they're the consequence of including headers in various objects that comprise the VM Linux binary. So, you know, the same the same header file can be included multiple times. So um, when you deduplicate all of that, um, we end up with a number around 80,000, um, which is a lot more tractable. So to encode that in BTF, really what we need to do is encode the name um, so the name is basically just the macro name. Um, and then the value is just the string associated with the value. Um, so there's, there's, there's a fairly straightforward way we could do that um, uh, in using a struct BTF type, which is the kind of base, um, base type that we use to encode information in BTF. Um, and if we do that um, with those sort of 80,000 odd um, definitions, the, BM, uh, the VM Linux um, BTF size grows by about you know, 3.3 megabytes. Um, so, you know, the, and the test that I did, it was it started off as about 6.3 megabytes, and then when we added that information, it grew to about 9.6 megabytes. So, we're, we're talking of growth certainly, but not an order of magnitude or anything like that. So, it's it's, it's not a massive addition. Um, but there are some caveats to this whole process. Um, so, we need some rules in processing macros because. You know, not only can we, do we have to deduplicate, deduplicate identical definitions, we have to worry about cases where there can be non-identical definitions. So across the whole kernel, there can be multiple definitions of, of a particular um, macro. Um, so one approach is basically just not to include any macros which have multiple conflicting values. Um, another thing that you might want to do as well is um, avoid encoding macros which have an associated undef with them. Um, these can be used some in in some cases, like you know the K build mod name um, definition for for a module name, um, you know for trace macros as well. Sometimes the undefs are being used. Um, so in general, it's a signal that something clever is being done, and we kind of want to avoid clever in this case because a lot of the time things won't compile if if, if things are too clever. Um, the other thing you want to do is look at excluding config variables because core the compile wants to run anywhere um, framework actually has a way of representing them as variables. Um, so having config macros as well um, can cause collisions with those. So we, we don't want we don't want that. And then we, there's a couple of um, definitions you probably want to exclude as well. So um, when you do all of that, um, you end up with about 68,000 definitions. Um, and then for split BTF, you have, we have to consider that as well because with split BTF, you've got the base BTF and then the BTF associated with the module. And you could imagine a situation where you'd have a definition in a module that differed with the definition in the core kernel BTF. Um, so we have to consider that case too. So the way I'm proposing this is done is you know a set of heuristics like that. But to be honest with you, this is going to require a bit of trial and error and the trial and error that i'm proposing that we use is to actually try and build as many of the bpf tracing programs in the bpf cell tests using vmlinux.h with macro support um, because in doing that we will likely run across a lot of the problems there's a couple of hundred files there so in doing that we can see some of the problems that can crop up when, when we're using macro definitions um, so what I'm proposing is the VMLinux.h would have a, a guarded section for the types, the, the standard VMLinux um, underscore H um, section. So that would be all the types. And then following that would be a, a guarded section for VMLinux macros um, dot H. So um, in that case, that, that macro section wouldn't exist. If there are no macros defined, um, that macro section wouldn't be there. So you can use the lack of presence of that macro section and that the lack of define of VM Linux macros H as a way of ha having your program handle the case where BTF macro information wasn't there. So if you've got an existing BPF program, the idea would be you can kind of handle the case where you don't have BTF macros by using that definition as a kind of guard. So here's an example. So this is a, a, a BPF program under self-tests. And we can see here that there's a bunch of definitions. And this is the kind of classic copy and paste that you have to do if you don't want to actually include the, the header files themselves. 
Um, so we can see um, if the VM Linux macros H aren't present in VM Linux H, we need to go and define these directly. Otherwise, we we don't have to worry about that. So that's kind of the best case scenario. Um, you know, we can we can run into problems with name collisions and definitions and so forth. So I think there's going to be a little bit of trial and error here. We're going to have to probably add more things to that exclude list um, that cause problems. Um, it's not going to be a perfectly clean uh, solution. I think it's going to be one of those things where practice will, will show up a lot of the problems that that could could crop up um, if we do choose to add the macro information. So um, the other thing is, of course, um, when we're dealing with macro definitions, um, we want to think about compile once run everywhere. So having that define change for different kernel versions is going to be a problem because if a flag is defined as one thing in one kernel and, and something else in another, ideally we'd want compile once run everywhere to take care of that um, for us transparently. Um, so the trick would probably be to do something like what's done for config um, parameters to have some kind of way of um, representing those flag values or, or you know numeric values as variables which are instantiated um, with the whatever the current type for that value is and then hopefully libpf could look at the elf section with with all that data and potentially rewrite those values based on the running kernel um so it would have to use the bpf type format and take the string definitions associated with the values and convert them to the appropriate type so there'd be a bit of work to be done to do this um and it would probably only be valuable for cases like that where we're dealing with things like flags um which can change from kernel to kernel um so let's see i think that kind of brings us to the end of talking about macros. So, um, as I say, this is kind of work in progress. I'd hope to get the the, the um, RFC patch set out this week, but I'm I'm kind of aiming to get the conversions of all the BPF self tests using this um, done first because I think that's the real proof of concept of this idea. And there's a bit of feedback between that process and figuring out what the right set of rules are for determining, you know, what macros get included, what macros get skipped. Um, so I'm hoping to have that sent out later this week. Um, so with that, there would be um, an RFC patch for, for the dwarves, um, uh, PA hell tool to, to handle the dwarf to BPF, BTF conversion for the macros. And then there's the libbpf and, and, and BPF side for actually handling the macro representations. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to get that sent out later this week. But um, the basics do work. Um, it's just going to be a question of how useful this is in practice because obviously if the macro definitions are causing problems with too many bpf programs due to defining things that then collide with data structure definitions or whatever um it's not going to be useful in practice and that's the aim here to basically make a bpf developer's life easier so i think we're just going to have to see how that plays out so if anyone's got any questions or comments or suggestions um maybe i'll just pause for a minute there and uh, and we can we can wait hi alan can you hear me yeah i can Lawrence. brilliant hi my name is lawrence and i work on a go library for ebpf kind of a user space so that's kind of my point of view um i was wondering um maybe i missed it um do you have an idea how to encode the names of arguments for macros so the approach that I've taken is quite simplistic. So th the name of the macro is basically everything before, in the case of macros that are parameterized, the name is everything before the opening bracket of that, that parameter list. And then the value, the value encompasses the parameter list and the values and, and, you know, and the rest of the macro itself. So it's very simplistic, um, but that does seem to do the trick. It, do, it does work in practice. Um, did you have any thoughts on, should that you, did you, is there a situation where having a separate encoding of parameters would be helpful or? Um, I, I don't know. I was just wondering um, how you do it. The, the thing is with, I, I kind of, I guess if you just use the, the name as it is, it works well if you end up generating C code from that, like the Linux.h, but it doesn't give us much more metadata to work with. Um, so we could say, oh, this is actually a macro that has these two arguments and then you could try and find those in the body, for example. Um, but that's kind of, I guess that kind of goes to my next um, question is for uh, BPF core. We also have an implementation for that and maybe it would be possible to kind of distinguish a macro that has an expression value 
from a macro that is a constant. I don't know how, how tricky that would be. Yeah, that's the thing. And, you know, there's other cases you can think of from a core perspective that would be useful, like, you know, field accessors. A lot of macros have, you know, simplify the field accessors. So in those kind of cases, you would like core to step in and, 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 and deal with those cases. But again, it's kind of tricky to think of a way to disambiguate things like that um, in, in, a, in a very clear way. So, yeah, it's, it's a hard problem. I mean, I think in that case, a lot of the time, you'd probably just fall back in defining your own version of, of, of the field access using the core, the BPF core read or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's hard to know how much metadata, metadata to associate with the macro. Um, the, the argument, certainly the, the idea of it being a parameterized macro would probably be useful to know. So maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't phrase my question very good. Like, um, I guess the, the metadata that you get is from Dwarf, I imagine. Mm. Is that right? Um, yeah. how, much, how much metadata does Dwarf have about macros? Like, what's the maximum we could put in there, I guess, is, is my way of asking. Like, if it's clear from the metadata you get from Dwarf that this is actually something that is constant-like, that is defined as a macro, but it's a constant. Is that something you could see from the dwarf, or do you have to kind of dig no, into that yourself? Yeah, it's just a string. Um, you just get a string back from dwarf, as far as I know. Um, so there isn't much metadata we can make use of there, unfortunately. OK, cool. Thank you. So we might move on to inline functions. So as I mentioned, one of the things that can happen when you're doing tracing um, is when you try and trace a function, um, you get a you know not found error. Um, and that's due to the fact that a lot of functions in the Linux kernel are inlined. Um, so there's no good solution for tracing them currently. Um, but we have to remember that we can trace uh, most instructions by using the k-probe of, of the function and the offset. So if we had addresses for the inline sites, we could potentially attach k-probes to fire for all the instances of an inline function. So ideally what we'd like is to have a way of specifying an inline function in the same way as we specify a non-inline function. So, you know, the K pro uh, slash inline function name. And perhaps if we wanted a specific site, you could do inline function at containing function. So, you know, the, whatever the function is the, that that function was inlined into, um, we, we can we can maybe, um, you know, specify just, just that case as wanted. Um, so again, you know, Dwarf comes to the rescue for GDB. So um, GDB knows about inline information um, from Dwarf. Um, so would it be feasible to augment BTF with that information? So um, one way you could do it would be to encode inline sites associated with the function. Um, so the way you could encode that potentially would be something like the BTF ID of the calling function, and then the offset within that f um, calling function where the that inline function was inline to and then perhaps the length of the inline function as well. So the way you could approach that would be to have for the BTF function um, definition, so there's a BTF kind func, so that could use a flag to specify an inline. And in the case that it is an inline function, um, the length, the info, a VLAN um, associated with that um, BTF type could specify the number of sites um, that, that are inline sites associated with that function, so that inline function. So each of those sites, again, would be the BTF ID of the caller um, the offset and the length of the, of the inline within the, the, that call function. Um, and the reason you need that length is because the inline, the way it's inline from function to function can, can vary slightly. So, the, you know, it's good to know how much of that function is actually represented by that the inline function side. Um, so with that encoding, um, the, the operation would be when you're dealing with the K probe, it would be, you know, we'll look up the function if it's not there. Uh, if it's in K all sims, we know it's a real function. And if it's not, um, we can look up that uh, BTF kind func, and if it's marked as an inline, as we, we talked about previously, um, we can say for each of those inline sites, we attach a K probe at the caller's address and offset. Um, so that would be one way to to implement that. Um, so the idea is that you can go from inline function to inline sites quite easily. So that's that's the kind of goal of that encoding mechanism. So um, when I ran some experiments here, uh, and this could be. Um, could, could be my own lack of ability in using um, the, the, the LFUTILS libraries. Um, it seemed like there was a lot of information missing for inline sites. So for the VM Linux image, there are about 36,000 inline functions. Um, 
for those, there's about 86,000 sites which have the kind of um, program counter values for the start and end, which are basically what we would use to identify, you know, which functions they fall within. Um, there's another 215,000 though that don't have those values. So in, the, in those cases, things would be incomplete. And obviously a concern here would be if you're actually specifying a probe for all the inline sites associated with a function, you don't want to just deal with, you know, what, 40% of them. So, or even less than that. Um, so, you know, we need to look into that a little bit more and figure out what's going on there. Um, so we need to think again in terms of BTF, what's the, what's the cost of encoding all this stuff? So if we talk about 16 bytes for each of those um, BTF kind funk um, representations, um, and then 16 bytes per inline site, um, we end up at about 1.86 megabytes for the smaller list, the 86,000. And I think the numbers are on there, but the, the, the total will be about five megabytes for the, for the possible inline sites. So that would assume that we could actually get that um, inline information about where those inline sites are for all, all of the inlines that are available in, in the Linux kernel. So, you know, we're talking about between two and five megabytes um, for, for that inline information. So, um, so that's, that's sort of the number to bear in mind when we think about the costs here. Um, now, the other thing to mention here is, you know, when we're at, at an entry point to a function, um, the, the struct PT register, the register information, we can pull out the arguments of that function very easily. And that's obviously not true when we're diving into the middle of a function. Um, so given that that's the case, it may not be necessary, you know, for a traditional um, function in BTF, we have the the... The, fu the function um, representation, which is the name, and then it points at a prototype for the function, which has all the type information about the arguments or return values. So if we can't make use of that prototype, um, it might not be necessary to encode it. Um, because as I say, we can't make that simple mapping from types of arguments to register values. Um, because like I say, we're in the middle of a function. So um, yeah, there, there's no simple mapping there. Um, and it's gonna vary from inline site to inline site. Um, so the other thing to mention is if we were doing an inline representation for split BTF, the same function name could be in both the base and the split. Um, so in that case, you'd need to have a representation of it in both places because there could be inline sites in both the core kernel and then kernel module as well. So you need to have a kind of double representation there that you wouldn't have in, in classic BTF, BP, yeah, BPF functions or BTF functions, which would be deduplicated in that case because they'd be identical. Um, because the sites are going to be different, we need to preserve a representation in both cases. That would be the, that would be the kind of wrinkle there. So I'll just pause for a minute there again, um, just in case anyone has any comments or suggestions there. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't really investigated this in practice. This is more sort of laying out the, the theoretical possibilities. Um, so, you know, we, we see it's, we're talking about about five megabytes in terms of cost um, at, at the upper end. Um, and, you know, the benefit here is that we get to see in a little bit more detail what's going on in terms of the execution path. The problem is, of course, uh, as I mentioned here previously, that we don't have easy access to the arguments of these unknown functions. Um, so that's something to bear in mind on, on the kind of cost side of the ledger as well. And, um inline functions subject to optimizations throughout the cola. So they will potentially be, re the code will be rearranged, not actually the inline function anymore. Yeah, um, maybe that's what's going on in some of the cases where we're not seeing any um, program counter information. Um, Hello? Hi, Alan. Hello. Hi. Um, hi. I have a, yeah, hi. I have a question about that are the inline function. Um, so that our inline function can be uh, what they are splitted. Um, uh, yeah, sometimes like a split the inline function into the the function so that the um, the you know uh, the it, depends on the, uh, the inline function fun uh, line number, um, the function, inline function body will be, uh, what's the, uh, the uh, 
let's say, mixed with the, the caller function code, how uh, can you, uh, let's say, uh, handle uh, that, mo uh, um, that case? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to spend a bit more time on this aspect of it. Um, there, the, the kind of assumption here is that there's, that there's an obvious kind of place where the, the code's been inlined and um, we can just attach there. Um, but yeah, there's, there, I'll, I'll need to investigate a bit further on this, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, those are uh, currently uh, the K probes uh, from the F3 side. We, I, um, I made our uh, path probe uh, to uh, to find that there are such kind of issues. So uh, currently, we are uh, using the uh, debug information directory. But uh, yeah, uh, if we use our BTF, that is our uh, some uh, issuing point. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Um, so just to finish things off um, quickly, um, this, and this is where we kind of delve into um, what's probably not feasible. Um, so you know, BTF has information about global variables, per CPU variables, function arguments, or return values. So the only missing thing from a variable perspective is local variables. Um, so if we were attaching to within the body of a function, um, that would be useful. Um, obviously, having information about you know what's in what register um, and how that maps to variables would would, would help us. Um, you know, ask questions such as, you know, if we're at a K-probe with an entry, what do the registers contain? Um, you can imagine we could have a BPF helper for that for a particular offset within a function. Um, so, you know, if we got to the point where we can figure that out, we're kind of at the true instruction level tracing um, state where, you know, we can attach to an arbitrary point in a function and figure out what's going on. So it's more a sort of theoretical endpoint than, than something that's probably practical in the near future. Um, but to run the numbers, um, so there's about two million um, variable instances um, within the dwarfing dwarf for the core kernel. Um, so even without location information, we're talking about over 30 megabytes for just the struct BTF type information there. So that's kind of an order of magnitude bigger than the current BTF. So you know, to me, that doesn't seem feasible um, because the whole you know part of the cell here for BTF is that it's small, um, and you know this is kind of pushing it out away from that quite significantly. Um, so, um, are there alternatives? Well, um, for BTF, we know information about the argument registers and return values. Um, so perhaps we could build some sort of graph of how register values evolve during the, the execution of a function. Um, you know, perhaps there's something in the verifier that, that does that kind of type tracking that we could use to, to kind of repurpose to actually scan kernel functions rather than BPF code in this way. Um, so obviously that's going to leave some things out because some local variables won't be connected if we have a graph if you imagine that kind of graph from um re from tracking register states so some things won't actually connect to that so some local variables might need to be um, represented um in that model um and maybe if we did want to encode something they'd be the ones to encode the things that we can't actually dynamically uh infer so you know the conclusion there the conclusion there would be, I think we probably need to look at some kind of dynamic um, inference methods to actually get information at an instruction level. Um, it's probably not feasible to encode all that ahead of time. Um, so just to summarize, I mean, you know, we've made huge, the BPF has made huge strides in observability and usability. Um, BTF has been a big, big part of that. Um, it can grow further capabilities and you know tools like gdb are a great source of ideas because they've had to wrestle with some similar problems um, in the past um, but in doing any kind of assessment um, the cost benefit always has to respect the key values in btf which are size and simplicity and you know as a kind of corollary of those the, the, it it's it always has to be present in running kernels um, so when we're getting to that sort of more expensive representation um, you know, we may need to look at having some sort of hybrid dynamic static methods for creating descriptions. 
um, that might be the only way to really get to that instruction level tracing. Is there um, a way point. to actually, I was wondering, is there a way to actually make it so you could uh, get all this information and load it as a module so you could be like, if, for those that don't need it, don't need to load it. And if you want to, you can either have it uh, dynamically added as a module that has all the information that you could need. And then That's a really nice idea, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's one way to do it because obviously, you know, 30 megabytes for some for some systems is way too much whereas for other people it's not it's not a big deal at all so um yeah that, that, that that's a nice potential compromise absolutely so there's just a few references um and that's going to be done um so as i said I'm hoping, i was hoping to get that rfc patch set for uh, bpf next and dwarfs sent out um ahead of the talk so I'll hopefully get that set out before the end of the week um, because I think it lays out the issues there in terms of representing macros a little bit more clearly. And we can, by looking at how it makes life easier for the self test, we can probably do, it's probably clear um, what the costs and benefits are there. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I actually did GDB development, and I didn't know about the GGDB switch until I looked into the text cases and how they worked. So, it is a very un less not so documented feature of GDB, and not many people know about it. Um, so, Alan, if you're done, we could do some Q and A. Sure. Okay. Anybody got questions? Let's test the chat, make sure I can get a posting in there. There's been issues with the chat, so I don't know. Yeah, because apparently it's making all the new accounts as we try to use it the first time instead of like ahead of time. Yeah, I apologize. I can't actually see the chat at the moment. So if anything pops up there, um, do let me know. I, uh, sorry, I, it took me a while to figure out how to enable the microphone. You have to join with microphone. So I, I wanted just to mention that we and uh, me and Yong Kong are attacking like this uh, VM Linux dot H plus macro problem from a slightly different angle. Uh, we are looking at actually extending the Clang to allow two different type definitions to coexist. Because like the biggest problem is like not that people want. Well, okay, that's one perspective, right? Like I think the biggest problem is not that people. Uh, really, really need like some macro to be available in VM Linux.h. The bigger problem is that you cannot include any other kernel header with VM Linux.h, right? So we are trying to attack this problem as uh, by essentially like allowing to uh, have like conflicting type definitions, but marking one of them as sort of like the main one and everything else as like the weak definitions. So when you include VM Linux.h first, and then you include some of the existing kernel headers. Second, if they have some uh, like redefinitions of task, type task struct and stuff like that, we'll just, well, not we, but the compiler will just ignore the second one. So that way you get access to all the macroses and static inline function definitions and stuff like that. Uh, so just, just be aware that there is a separate work thread for that. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that that sounds great. Yeah, we have we have a similar problem with the macros um, because one of the things that happens if, is if you define all the macros, you get all the guards associated with those header files defined. Um, so, you know, they're one of the they're obviously macros themselves. So, one of the questions I'm kind of wondering about is, do we include the header guards? Because obviously, if you then include a kernel header file, you've already defined the guards. So, if if that's included afterwards, then you don't get any of those definitions. So there is, you know, there's a kind of, um, there's a push and pull here between um, kind of satisfying the, you know, you want the types, you want the macros, and then you want some types and not others. So it's a tricky problem in practice. I think the only way I can answer to my satisfaction is make, ensure that for all of the self-tests that things are working well. Um, I think this is one of those problems where the solution is probably not going to be theoretically perfectly clean, but, you know, it's, it's hopefully going to be practically useful. To be honest, I think self tests will be a little bit too simplistic for like the real tracing application. So I'm not sure, like even if like all the self tests work really well, like that in practice, it, this will work really well for like real world applications. Uh, so like, but another point, so I think like 
this macro stuff as a string, right? That's what, what makes it hard because it's, it's strings. Uh, and it sort of conflicts with the core idea, right? Because core gives you this promise that like whatever you are doing is like relocatable and adjustable across uh, kernels, right? And that's not generally true for macros because like when the macro is defined, you compile it and like if it changes on another kernel, then like you have no way to adjust it. Unless it's like one specific use case where we probably can make it like completely core compatible. It's like when it's integer, right? As you yeah. mentioned, like you can do it as a uh, as a variable or like something like kconfig and then libpf can adjust that. But like everything else, like even strings are hard though. Like strings, we can think about this, but like if it's just some random expression and like what if that expression changes? Like you, you break the guarantee of the real, uh, like core relocation stuff, right? So what, what do you think about that? Like, I, I wonder if it's actually more dangerous to include such macroses into VM Linux at edge, because we give an illusion that like, oh, just use this. And like, if something kernel changes, we will sort of take care of this and we cannot really. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky problem. I think if we're clear about the, you know, I guess it's one of those things that you might have to just have some caveats around. And if there's guards around all of those macro definitions, people can choose whether they maybe just want the type information or they just want the macro information or they want both. So I think if we give people options, you know, it's, it's, that's probably the best we could do. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's not ideal, but um, it may be helpful. Well, th uh Look, look for the clank. Uh, I think the discussion was called peak types, but it's on separate mailing lists on the clank mailing list. Uh, I think like that that approach has benefits that you know if you are going to use something like some internal definition from the kernel, static inline function, or, or some pound defined macro expression, right? At least you are sort of aware that you are using something outside of relocatable subset of like VM Linux .h, right? So that that, that gives you. A little bit more well not you that the user a little bit more warning like beware this this might break right yeah yeah i think that's important absolutely mm -hmm. all right thanks thanks Audrey. yeah the guiding principle should be keep it simple at first and add complexity later as needed